Ah, just lost uh, the camera right there for a second. But as we were just saying that uh, in the classical idea of education, it was this liberal education that was supposed to be uh, a free education where you're not necessarily worried about practical things. You're truly just learning for its own sake without the need for it to necessarily be useful for anything. It's truly free, right? It's um, And now... When, when we compare that to uh, our modern sense of education, this sense that we need our education to be um, certain and useful, right? We don't necessarily always get that in that free education. We certainly maybe have a sense of certainty that our goal is wisdom. And if your goal is to be wise, you want to be correct. You want to have certainty. But usefulness wasn't necessarily required. You didn't necessarily study because you thought it was going to do great things for you, except for perhaps just to be able to know for its own sake. But Descartes wants both of these things, right? And so as I was saying, Descartes Part is going to try to help us understand his critique of this classical idea of education in terms of these two categories, certainty and usefulness. And he's going to contrast primarily, as we said, um, philosophy and mathematics, right? We're going to talk about how philosophy and mathematics fundamentally differ. And Descartes was both a mathematician and a philosopher, so he's well equipped to criticize math and philosophy along these two lines, right? And so in particular, um, Descartes going to look at the certainty uh, that exists, the certainty that exists, and the usefulness that exists in both mathematics and, and philosophy. And we're going to start with philosophy because, we're, as we're going to see, de despite Descartes' philosophy, um, despite despite Descartes being a math um, a philosopher, he's extraordinarily critical of the nature of philosophy as he's encountering it. Right, and so we're going to just look at a couple of spots here in the Discourse on Method. So first we're going to open up here to page, um, da, 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 da. this is our page uh, five. Um, here we're going to see t Descartes talking about uh, the, the, the kind of um, certainty that you get in philosophy. And he says, um, concerning philosophy, I shall own, I, excuse me, if I can speak. <laughs> concerning philosophy, I shall say only that, seeing that it has been cultivated for many centuries that by the most excellent minds that have ever lived, and that nevertheless, there is still nothing in it about which there is not some dispute. Notice he says there, there's nothing in it. There's nothing in it about which there is not some dispute. And consequently, nothing that is not doubtful. There's nothing that is not doubtful because there's always some dispute, right? I was not at all so presumptuous as to hope to fare any better there than the others. And that considering how many opinions there can be about the very same matter that are held by learned people, right? Without there ever being the possibility of more than one opinion being true, I deemed everything that was merely probable to be well nigh false. Now, this is kind of interesting, right? But we talked about the nature of opinion and whether opinions can be true or opinions can be false. And Descartes fundamentally saying that if people have fundamentally contradictory opinions, it's not possible that everyone is right. What does he notice? There's tons of opinions. The nature of philosophy is to be about things that are disputed. So Descartes' fundamental criticism of philosophy is that everything is disputed, right? That there's lots of dispute. Now, here's an interesting thing. This, this criticism of philosophy can be a criticism that's perfectly understood by someone who is not a philosopher. If you just observe philosophy, like if you were just here looking at people doing philosophy, then you're, you're immediately going to see this person over here saying that thing and this person over here over here saying that thing and uh, what's wrong with that guy's face I don't even know and and these people are all going to be arguing and, and 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 angry with each other maybe not necessarily angry though that, that maybe the anger is uh, is the wrong thing but people are constantly engaging in this argument right and so it seems just from an outsider looking in when you look at this you're you're going to think hmm Everything that people talk about in philosophy seems to be argued by all these philosophers. It doesn't seem like they ever arrive at any kind of certain conclusion. Therefore, everything in philosophy is doubtful. Now, I don't know if that's a fair criticism, because it's possible that even though people dispute a bunch of things, um, it, that, that things aren't necessarily doubtful, um, you, you might have that, just like Descartes said, one person that's right and one person that's wrong. And even if someone doubts the correctness of a correct statement, doesn't mean that it's not true. Someone could doubt the Pythagorean theorem, and yet the Pythagorean theorem would still hold. Um, and so, interestingly, all right, there, there's Descartes' fundamental criticism of the certainty of philosophy. Uh, we'll see some other spots, too, but that's all we need for now. Let's go to the usefulness of philosophy. I'm still here in part one. 
Descartes, will, and we're going to turn now to uh, go back just a page to page uh, four towards the top here. Descartes has a, a, a quick little litany where he criticizes um, just in a sentence of many aspects of his education. But here we'll see another comment about philosophy. He says right at the top of page four, he says, philosophy provides the means of speaking plausibly about all things and of making oneself admired by the less learned. What's the good of philosophy? Speaking plausibly about all things and making oneself admired. What's the usefulness of philosophy? It's um, to speak plausibly, right? Now, just to speak plausibly, um, if can I write plausibly, I don't think I spelled that right. Speak plausibly. What does that make it sound like? To be speak plausibly and be admired by the less learning. This to me, when I hear this, this to me sounds like sophistry. Do you guys remember the sophists? You remember the sophists who walked around the city of Athens, who were these teachers of ancient, of rhetoric that fundamentally taught people how to be persuasive, how to speak plausibly about all things. Descartes is fundamentally accusing philosophy of being sophistry again. He's, 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 in some ways, he's making himself like a new Socrates. And what did Socrates do, right? So, um, we, uh, Socrates walked around the city of Athens challenging people that they didn't necessarily know what they thought they knew, right? And he, he tried to help them realize that all of their understanding would seem to be just this kind of un, undefined vagueness. And that in order to have true understanding, you had to get to the true definitions of things, which fundamentally ultimately became these forms and these beautiful metaphysical notions of the perfect version of reality itself, right? Um, now, Descartes is not going to be uh, so Socrates in that metaphysical respect. He's going to take some very different kind of views, but he's setting himself up like a new kind of Socrates, saying that philosophy is sophistry once again, and we need a new start to philosophy to have some Something that is both certain and something that is both useful. Okay, so let's contrast that with mathematics. When Descartes thinks about mathematics, and, and Descartes was a mathematician, I'm going to talk about the mathematics of Descartes in, um, in another video, but um, Descartes was a mathematician. What does he say about math? Well, is math certain? Is math useful? What do you think he's going to say? Well, on page four, towards the very bottom, um, uh, still in part one, Descartes here says, I delighted most of all in mathematics because of the certainty and the evidence of its reasonings. But I did not yet, yet notice its true use and thinking that it was merely, uh, excuse me, that it was of service merely to the mechanical arts. I was astonished by the fact that no one had built anything more noble upon its foundations, given that they were so solid and firm. Right. Um, so I, I, let's. There's two things that happen right there in that in that one long sentence. Descartes describes both the certainty and the, the usefulness of mathematics. Right. In terms of mathematics certainty, he said he he talked about the sort of the certain evidence of its reasonings, the the evidence of the reasoning itself, evidence of reasoning, and he talked about um, the the kind of solid foundations. Uh, of that reasoning. And we're going to, again, we'll, we'll have a follow-up video where we talk about, we're, we're going to do some math and think about math. We're going to try to understand why he saw, what does he mean by talking about the evidence of the reasoning, the solid foundations of mathematics, right? Um, uh, and then this other dimension that we saw here is notice that he, he said that it, that he was surprised that up to now, uh, mathematics would seem to only be of service to the mechanical arts, and that nothing had been built more noble upon these foundations. What Descartes is fundamentally saying here is that certainly uh, math is already useful to the mechanical arts, right? Um, and certainly if we think of the, the, the uh, what is engineering today, engineering is mathematics, right? Um, but he also talks about some, some, he alludes to something more noble. So some kind of noble end of mathematics that's different from just what we've seen so far. So, um, We'll, we'll explore the nature of mathematics um, in trying to understand in particular how, ma uh, how mathematics will help Descartes get to this goal of certainty and philosophy in, in the next video. But let's just see fundamentally what was it, it, how, it, the result of this criticism. Descartes says, I want philosophy to be more like math. Philosophy up to now has been become sophistry and doubtful because everything is constantly disputed and nothing useful seems to come out of it. So what Descartes is going to set to do in the Discourse on Method is to solve these two problems. He's going to try to, first of all, solve the problem of certainty. Try to see what is something that we can arrive, what's some knowledge we can arrive at that would in no way be, be doubtful, in no way be able to be disputed by anyone. 
And then, and that's going to happen from in parts two and in parts four. Then in parts five and six, Descartes going to take up the problem of the usefulness of our learning and understanding. He's going to talk about philosophy in a kind of broader sense, in a kind of and an old idea of everything that's included under philosophy, and try to see what's the kind of useful uh, aspect that we can get out of our fundamental learning and understanding of the nature itself, right? And so that's where this text is going. Um, Let's let's just look at uh, one more line here in part one that will help us uh, see how he finishes this off. Here at the very bottom of page five, Descartes says, um, after criticizing philosophy some more, um, he says, that's why as soon as age permitted me to emerge from the supervision of my teachers, I completely abandoned the study of letters. Now, study of letters, study this classical idea of education, right? Um, and resolving to search for no knowledge other than what could be found within myself or else in the great book of the world, I spent the rest of my youth and he goes on and on and on. But there's two, there's the key things. What is going to be the source of Descartes' new education? He's going to look within myself and the great book of the world in myself and in the world itself. There's th these are these are these are the two books he's going to read. <laughs> Neither of these are books written by any philosopher. He's going to reject the entire culmination and history of our learning up to now and he's going to try to begin philosophy again from scratch. We're going to see fundamentally that the certainty Descartes is going to achieve is going to come from within himself. This idea of looking within himself, that's where he's going to find certainty in an interesting way. And in terms of this new kind of usefulness is where he's going to really dig into the great book of the world in a way that's much more profound than, than um, perhaps people have up to that point in time. And so this is the fundamentals of part one. Um, in, uh, in the next video, we're going to examine some of this idea of the mathematics and how mathematics sets up the idea of certainty. And then we'll take a look at Descartes' method. And then in, in, a, in another series of videos, we'll actually see the application of Descartes' uh, fundamental um, uh, methodological doubt where he carries out and finds the fundamental things that we can be certain of. So um, I hope you enjoy. Have a beautiful day and catch you on the flip side.